You might think that investing in oil companies is the same as betting that the oil price will go either up or down. Today we're going to show you that this isn't necessarily the case, and we're also going to teach you how to distinguish a good oil company from a bad one. But before we get into looking at oil companies, we first need to talk about what oil actually is. Oil is a lot more than a liquid, and it's oftentimes referred to as petroleum instead of oil, and it's basically organic material that has been lying underneath the Earth's surface for millions and millions of years. This can be plankton and algae, and even dinosaurs. The global oil market is colossal, and it underpins a lot of the economic activity that happens around us every single day. The daily demand for oil is at around 100 million barrels. Oil's versatility is also almost unmatched. It's used in everything from the cars that we drive to the planes that we fly, and it's also used in synthetic rubber and plastics. So who uses the most oil? The most amount of oil is consumed within the transportation industry, and some experts have estimated that around 70% of all daily consumption of oil is used towards transportation. Industrials and manufacturing comes close by, where it's used in many processes like the ones we mentioned with synthetic rubber or plastics, and after that we have private use where it's used to heat up homes. And remember, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Oil is used in so many things that you probably haven't heard of half of them. Let's take a look at the oil value chain. Now, the oil value chain is extremely complex and it has some of the biggest companies in the world present in it. And what you'll notice as we go through this is that a lot of the companies that we're talking about are actually doing multiple parts of the value chain. Let's categorize them into five primary types. And we're going to start with the first one, which is upstream companies. Upstream companies are the main producers of oil. So in this category, you would find companies like ExxonMobil and Chevron. And what they do mainly is that they pump oil up from the ground. Another important aspect of what upstream companies do is that they also do exploration. So this is finding new oil fields and also figuring out where to put the wells. Companies like these are pretty sensitive to variations in oil price. You can view these guys as the adventurers. They're sort of exploring the world and tapping the Earth's hidden resources. Next up, we find the midstream companies. These companies are the ones that transport and store oil. So here you would find companies like Kinder Morgan, for example. And what they aim to do is to lock in long-term contracts for the transportation and the storage of oil, which then decreases the overall volatility in the industry and also makes where the oil is going pretty predictable. If you're noticing a pattern, you would be right, because the next one that we're going to cover is the downstream companies. So what downstream companies do is that they refine oil. And after crude oil has been refined, you can then turn it into more valuable products. And this could be stuff like, for example, plastics or asphalt. Low oil prices could actually be good for these companies because it means that their input costs would be lower. Next on the list is integrated oil companies. And these are the true giants of the industry. So they do absolutely everything. They do uh, downstream operations, midstream operations, and upstream. In this category, you will find companies like Royal Dutch Shell and BP, as well as Total Energies in France. The last one on the list is the oil field service companies. These guys are the backbone of the industry, which provides both equipment and people when you want to do exploration or when you want to do drilling. Examples of companies in this role would be Schlumberger. Some of their responsibility includes things like building the actual oil rigs and making the wells that are going to be drilled. Just based on the value chain that I mentioned now, you'll probably understand a little bit of how the industry works and what the steps are from start to finish. But let's also go through how we start with exploration of an oil field and we get to delivery at the end. The first step is exploration. And this is the part where upstream companies are aided by geophysicists and geologists in order to find exciting places to drill for oil. This would be analyzing subsurface structures and predicting how much oil could be in them. Following a promising find, you need to appraise that find. And what that means is that you would look at what the well size is and how big the reservoir is to try to determine what's the value of this reservoir before you start digging wells in order to see is this going to be a profitable location or not. If the appraisal results are positive, then the field is going to be developed. This stage involves the design of wellheads and also designing rigs and setting up production facilities. Upstream companies and oil field service providers such as Halliburton and Schlumberger supporting with both equipment and people. After the field has been developed, we get to the moment of truth, which is extraction. In this stage, you actually start pumping up the oil and various methods are used based on the characteristics of the reservoir. Once the oil has been extracted, it goes on its long journey towards refineries. And this is the transportation phase of oil. In this category, you will find a lot of companies like midstream operators, as well as pipeline operators, which aim to transport the oil to its final destination in a safe manner. When the oil has been transported to a refinery, the oil is transformed uh, into multiple other products through the process of refining, where you can make, for example, plastics, like we mentioned earlier, synthetic rubber, petrochemicals used in medicine, 
and a lot of other things. Once the products have been refined, they're taken to storage facilities and distribution centers. From there, they're subsequently transported to other industries such as manufacturing, and they're also put into gas stations. In the final stage, retail companies and gas stations deliver these products into the hands of end users and consumers. It's important to note that we've, until now, only looked at the oil industry. We have not looked at natural gas specifically. And a lot of these companies, due to their size and the fact that they're drilling up oil, they will also produce natural gas, which is transported in a lot of similar ways, but the end use is, is often different. We can also see that a lot of these companies, and especially the big ones, are using their dominant market position to make the transition into renewables a lot easier for themselves. You might be thinking that this industry is quite complex, and you'd be right, because it is very complex and it has a lot of different actors. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to look at some of the business models. And in order to not be completely overwhelmed, we're going to limit ourselves to look at only the upstream and downstream business models. Now we're going to explore four of the most primary business models within the industry. And which business model is chosen often varies a lot based on geography. The first business model that we're going to look at is conventional onshore exploration and production. This model is perhaps the most traditional within the oil industry. And in it, you would find companies such as ExxonMobil and Saudi Aramco, which do geological surveys and drill test wells in well-known oil-rich regions. The extraction under this model is often done using traditional techniques, so that would be vertical drilling in most cases. And while the risks include geological uncertainty, the business model benefits a lot because the technology is known and the costs are relatively low compared to on-water drilling, for example. Some key geographies that employ this model is the Middle East, Russia, and even some parts in Africa. The next model that we're going to look at is offshore exploration and production. The offshore model is a bit more complex than onshore, and this is due to the environments that these rigs stand in. These rigs are often made in deep, deep waters and has a higher operational cost associated with them. And the rigs will often have an extended period of life, allowing you to drill up more oil than you would perhaps onshore. Some of the key regions where this takes place is the North Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Brazilian coast. There are also more unconventional methods of extracting oil and gas. This could hit closer to home if you're an American, because this is basically what the shale industry is all about. This model relies on using a lot of water to gain access to previously unavailable oil and gas reserves in order to extract it. This approach is widely used in the United States, Canada, and also Argentina. Enhanced oil recovery is a process that is often used in order to extend the life of an existing oil field. Techniques like gas injection, thermal recovery, and chemical flooding are processes often used by companies such as Occidental Petroleum. EOR is technologically complex and it costs a lot of money, but as a consequence, you might be able to extend the life of your already existing oil fields, not having to drill new ones. It's common in mature oil fields in the United States, China, and the Middle East. Each business model in the oil sector has a distinct approach to both costs, environmental risks, as well as technology used. And it's really important for you as an investor to understand how this might impact the companies that you're evaluating. Did you know that oil isn't just oil? There are multiple different benchmarks and types of oil that we need to discuss, and all of them are priced differently. Some of the most commonly discussed types of oil would be, for example, Brent crude oil, which originates from the North Sea, and it's traded on the Intercontinental Exchange. We also have WTI, or the West Texas Intermediate, which would be oil that's found in the Permian Basin, and we also have the Dubai and Oman standard, which is Middle Eastern oil. All of these oils have different characteristics, and for all the different companies that we've discussed, the oil price in and of itself is hugely important. So how do you actually identify which oil company is a good oil company? Now, it sort of goes without saying, but we're going to say it anyway, is that these companies all rely heavily on the oil price. So these companies are very cyclical in nature. But what we're going to do now is that we're going to look at a couple of metrics that aren't your traditional financial metrics, but that can be used exclusively for oil companies. The first metric that we're going to look at is EV to production. Enterprise value to production offers a glimpse into how the market values a company relative to its production levels. A lower EV to production ratio might suggest that a company is undervalued. EV to 2P is another really interesting metric, and this is the valuation of a company's reserves. The 2P stands for probable and proven. This metric can often be pretty hard to find, and especially if you're just looking at a company's books. So if you have access to more advanced tools such as Bloomberg or Factsheet, we would highly recommend using those sources as well. A low value on this metric might also indicate that the company is undervalued because higher reserves is better. The next one that we're going to look at is price to cash flow. And this is one of the more traditional financial metrics that you will find for almost any other company. But oil in and of itself is very capital intensive, and knowing that you can manage this is extremely important. 
So a lower price to cash flow ratio might also indicate that the company is undervalued. Due to the capital intensive and cyclical nature of the oil industry, the enterprise value to debt adjusted cash flow is a very important metric to look at. There has been more than one occasion where companies like ExxonMobil has paid dividends not supported by their net income. A low ratio would indicate a more robust company. It's also important to look at the company's sensitivity to the oil price itself. Companies with downstream operations, such as refiners, often exhibit less sensitivity than the ones that do only upstream activities. In cases where the oil price is low, you might see a lot of companies accumulating more debt if they're very sensitive to the oil price compared to more robust ones. Like we mentioned earlier, oil is a massive, massive market and it touches almost every part of the world. So geopolitical risk is something that you definitely have to tangle with. And as an example, you can just look to Russia. The last one that we're going to look at is the reserve replacement ratio. A high replacement ratio is essential for a company to continue on living. And of course, we also encourage you to look at all the other traditional finance metrics that you find out there. So having a healthy balance sheet, seeing that they're not overloaded with debt, and also that they have good cash flow. Do you have a favorite oil company? Do you have one in your portfolio right now? Let us know in the comments down below.